host community and our colleagues from Arabic University and their students. The first keynote lecture of the Enrichment in the Fall program is about design fiction. It is a great honor to have Julian with us today. Julian Blicker is a designer, technologist, and researcher at the Near Future Laboratory in Los Angeles. He investigates emerging social practices, and his focus is on hands-on design, physical construction, prototyping, observation, and design science fiction as a way to raise questions, reveal hidden insights, and yield innovations that lead to design that makes the world a more playful place. Please welcome Julian Blicker. Thank you for that. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So yes, I want to talk to you about what I call designing futures uh, using a technique or approach to design and innovation that I call design fiction. And this is a practice that has evolved over the last 10 or 12 years, uh, along with colleagues of mine when I was teaching at university and uh, other members of the Near Future Laboratory. So maybe just briefly I'll describe to you uh, the Near Future Laboratory. So it's actually a studio, it's a design practice. It's a very informal practice, so there are four of us. We're based all around the world, so I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, Nick Foster is in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Uh, Nicola Nova is in Geneva and Fabian Jardin is in Madrid. And so sometimes we come together and we sort of develop and evolve projects that are inspired by our own interests and our own sort of desire to see something in the world. And we do it in a very sort of light way, in a very playful way, and we found that keeping things creative uh, in, a, in a playful sense is a fantastic way to involve and engage people and get people talking about what could possibly be in the future. So design fiction is our approach to imagining the future. And so it's a way of combining the practice of design in a very tangible sense, so actually building things, making things, with fiction, which as we know is a fantastic way to sort of think and evolve and sort of develop and evolve ideas. And specifically, we focus on bringing those two things together. So how can you make things, actually build things, that are in some sense sort of fictional, they don't quite exactly exist, but they might, they could be, and using those two approaches together to begin to tell stories about what the future might look like. And so that's why we call it designing fiction. So we actually creating things that are not quite true, but not quite false, and they might be a little bit confusing, but they open up the mind to thinking and to inserting oneself into those possible futures. So what are some of the ways we imagine the future? Well, we know that stories are a fantastic way. We have conversations, we talk about, we develop narratives, we imagine characters in some future. We might talk about robots and what those robots might do. And science fiction, of course, is one of the most powerful ways of telling futures, uh, stories about the future that have something to do with science and technology in some fashion. And it's an incredibly liberating way to approach it because not everything has to be necessarily absolutely true. It's a bit different from doing traditional engineering work and traditional scientific study work where people expect the results to be repeatable. They expect them to be things that actually exist in the world. And so the stories that we tell are sort of combinations. Typically we'll do storytelling in a narrative sense or just having conversations, but then also we use film. because Film is a very powerful way to involve someone, engage something. It's a very powerful technique for having someone be able to see what the future could possibly be like, hear a story about it, and almost suspend their disbelief. And this call came from a, a friend and a colleague of mine called David Kirby. So David's a remarkable uh, scholar, academic, so he wrote this paper uh, years ago called The Future Is Now. And the subtitle is Diegetic Prototypes and the Role of Popular Film in Generating Re Real World Technological Development. Now what does that mean? So it's a sort of long, complicated title that basically describes his argument that popular cinema, so films uh, that are, have some basis in science, are one of the most powerful ways in which a large public audience comes to understand what the possibilities are for science and technology. And he gives these wonderful examples. So one of my favorite examples that he gives is Jurassic Park. So the film Jurassic Park tells a story about how scientists are able to regenerate dinosaurs from paleo DNA. And they're able to do that through a set of techniques that in the film is actually shown to you. 
in this very legible way. So you're almost like looking at like a science film that you might see if you were sitting in class studying genetics. And in the beginning of the film, they actually take the audience by the hand. So us watching the film, they take us by the hand and actually lead us through the processes that would lead to the possibility of dinosaurs. And so we're like, hmm, that seems like entirely plausible. Like the science seems to make sense with what we understand genetics and DNA are able to do. And not only do they do that, afterwards, if you remember the film, they go out and they actually see dinosaurs. So you have this moment of awe where they look up and they see a huge brontosaurus. And that huge brontosaurus is suddenly there, real and alive. And the one scientist in the film, he actually crumbles to his knees in disbelief, finally seeing it. And once we're told that story, that dinosaur, in, in David's uh, argument, is the diegetic prototype. It is the prototype of the possibility of science and technology coming together to create dinosaurs. And once we see that, then we can enjoy the film. We, don't, we stop disbelieving the fact that dinosaurs are actually possible. And then all these other wonderful things happen outside of the film itself. So there was a, there was a, a traveling science exhibit that went to a lot of natural history museums that also used Jurassic Park as a basis to educate people about dinosaurs and how they might have looked and how they might have behaved. There are all these wonderful arguments that went on in the scientific uh, journals about whether or not that science was actually possible. So you have scientists now arguing about science fiction, which is absolutely wonderful. So all of a sudden this crosstalk happens between the world of fiction and the world of fact, all through this wonderful film done by, uh, my, written by Michael Crichton and directed by Steven Spielberg, amazing, amazing visual storyteller. And there are tons and tons of these examples. And I'll share with you some of them in a moment. So the use of diegetic prototypes to, to suspend disbelief about the future is at the core of this idea of design fiction. And design fiction, at least the way I like to employ it, is basically telling stories about tomorrow through very normal, ordinary, and everyday kinds of experiences. So this, to me, brings it down to the everyday. It brings it down to the experiences that you and I can sort of comprehend and understand. And our exposure to science, our exposure to technology in this era is so thorough, we experience it at so many different levels that we can almost understand and accept things that if you translate it into the kind of experience I might have, say if I'm sitting at home using a robot, it almost seems like, okay, that seems real. I, see, I can imagine that. So what I'd like to do for the remainder of the talk is go through a number of uh, examples what I call design fiction idioms. So these are approaches to doing design fiction. And hopefully this gives you a sense of how it's done, some examples of how it's done, and then hopefully you can think about how you might employ it in your own work. So there are gonna be four of them. So there'll be film, repair manuals, because things in the future break just like they do today, quick start guides, because we're always trying to understand how we can just quickly use a new bit of technology, and the quick start guide itself is an incredibly powerful way to explain a technology. And then product catalogs, because things, you know, you have to buy them someplace and they must be listed somewhere. And so this is another way and approach to describing a future through something that's just very, very ordinary. So let's start with film. So this first example is a film called They Live. It was done in 1998. And for me, this is basically a prototype of augmented reality. And it might be something that Google should have looked at before they made Google Glass. So you have like, is it real? No. That's what it looks like. Wait a minute. I don't get it. I put these glasses on, and now I see something different. What the? Oh, no, it's just a regular ad. No. <laughs> it isn't. And so in this film, the glasses are what I would describe as a diegetic prototype that's explaining to us what be our behaviors might be like, what a world might be experienced like if there were these special glasses. Again, this is 1998. So this is way before Google Glass. And in a way, it sort of shows the prescience of you know, a bunch of science fiction writing, some storytelling, uh, filmmakers, in order to show what this world might be like. And in this case, the world is one in which there's a whole sublayer going on where humanity is being controlled in a subversive way, kind of the way advertising works. So it's a little bit of a, little bit of a send up of like advertising the behaviors around it. Very important film, and lots of fun to watch. Another like mega important film, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And I have to point out, so this was made in 1968, so probably before a lot of us were born. And in this film in 1968, so we, the, the space program was in full swing. There was still a lot of questions about what space travel was like, what it would be like to travel even beyond the moon, travel like light years away. And 
the representation of space travel in the film is probably one of the most powerful that I've ever seen and noticed, and it's for a particular reason. Specifically, this is just one example, the representations of the technology in and around the astronauts and the space travel. So in 1968, there were barely computers. And the computers, even the computers that were used in the space program were barely computers as we understand them today. Their memory was literally hunks of magnets with copper wire wrapped around these coils that represented one bit, huge, heavy things. So the idea of a graphical user interface, something we take for granted today, it's all in all of our pockets, I'm sure, today, did not exist at all. So it took the power of the imagination of a filmmaker together working with, a, in, with Stanley Kubrick, the way he makes films, an elaborate production design team, including rocket scientists, actual rocket, rocket scientists, that he hired to help him imagine what the world might be like. And to even do these kinds of displays in, a, in, the, in the context of film production was an exceptional feat itself. There were no computers to do computer graphics special effects. It was all done in camera. And then to imagine what they might look like. And even like the little notes, so he adds, you can see at one point, there's a IBM logo representing the fact that there could be this thing called IBM in the future that would actually be participating in creating these kinds of systems. Remarkable uh, foresight and way to, ability to represent these things. And I think, I, I remember seeing that there will be someone talking about 2001 in a few weeks here, which would be uh, wonderful to see. So this was the, one of the original movie posters uh, from the film, again, in 1968. You know, kind of wonderful, kind of imaginary sort of illustration representing like, okay, space travel, astronauts actually working on the moon routinely, it seems. Look, they're checking things off on a list. They're taking photographs and readings of things. If you look a little closer, you notice that they have this kind of like pad-like bit of technology that they're doing something with. So 1968, was Steve Jobs even born then? Maybe. But I certainly didn't see this. And so in a way, you start seeing like they're imagining these things that in the future, they might call them iPads. I don't know, something like that. And then he shows them how they might actually work and how they might behave. So people, uh, astronauts, eating their not particularly appetizing food, sort of pushing around the plate, and listening to the news uh, on these iPads. So again, I have to point out, 1968. And in a way, this is a prototype you know, of what we, would, what we might experience in the future. And they were just kind of playing it through. So like they could imagine a world in which this, these would be the special consoles that the astronauts might have. And it even went so far as to be used as an example. So that clip I just showed you was used in a court of law when, when Samsung was suing Apple, saying that, that actually Apple shouldn't have exclusive rights to that particular form factor and that technology. They actually pointed to a science fiction film in a court of law to represent the fact that there was prior art leading up to the iPad, which I find absolutely fascinating. So it's not just us talking about it over coffee. It's a bunch of very high-paid lawyers going and saying, like, look, there is prior art, and then going to science fiction to actually show where the prior art exists. So it's almost like the science fiction is becoming a basis for a factual argument. And that's that power, that relationship between fact and fiction that I think to a certain degree we need to allow to be a little bit more fluid. We need to allow our imaginations to blossom into that world where fiction can actually shape and inform our understanding of what we can make and what we can design and what we can build and what the world should be like. Here's a little film that uh, we made at the Near Future Laboratory that was looking at new kinds of gesture interface. So I'll just let it play for a moment. So here we see that the visual recognition system doesn't work because her makeup isn't the same as it was when it first took the view. These are the kinds of problems that people will have in the future, even today, right? If your thumb is a little bit, got a little dirt on it, and you try to do touch, it won't work quite well. Call Gerardo. Name unknown. Call Gerardo. Name unknown. Call Gerardo. Calling Gerardo. So this happens. We know hey, this. Gerardo. Did you call? Yeah. Uh, are we still on the coffee? Yeah. I will um, be there. I'm running a little late, but we'll be there by here. Okay. Right. Oh. Call ended. So she did the wrong. She did the gesture call to show someone Gerardo. to move ahead, and she hung up on the phone. Gerardo. 
Sorry, I accidentally hung up. That's fine. So are we meeting at an hour and Yeah, let's meet in like half an hour. Okay. See you there. Bye. Call ended. So this is an example of a, uh, you know, so our interest and desire to sort of understand what the rituals of, for interaction behaviors might be in the future. And rather than writing a research report or uh, doing some kind of study, we just sat together and we sort of talked about what some of the uh, interesting challenges might be around that. And then just scripted a little short film and all did it all in about um, a long weekend. And so the objective of that is to uh, have something that's a little bit more engaging, a little bit more playful to begin to explore these things. And then at the same time, what we, rather than, and, and the, the reasons aren't always entirely clear to me why we like to show the, the points of failure, the areas where the technology is gonna be challenged. And I think that might come from uh, the fact that oftentimes when you have design and sort of engineering and technology working together, people imagine it being completely perfect. They're not able to imagine the points uh, at which the things, uh, things conflict, human behavior, human expectation, the capabilities of technology, the capabilities of science do not always come together in a perfect way. And that almost se makes it seem a little bit more believable if you show those points of failure, you show the areas where things don't work as expected. So now uh, let's move on to repair manuals. So repair manuals are fun to me because they, they allow you to sort of get, get deep into the actual material, the actual working functionality of a bit of technology. And repair manuals also signal that things don't always work the way they expected. That things fall apart, that there's an entire infrastructure, a support around these kinds of, uh, around kind of technology, no matter how new, how great, how cool, how awesome, where your iPhone screen gets cracked. So now what do you do? There's a repair, there's a repair procedure for doing that. Uh, something doesn't work as expected, brand new. Why isn't this thing working? You have to go someplace and have someone fix it. And that just sort of signals for me like a certain kind of reality to technology. And it also, in a, in, a, in a more formal sense, it begins to make us as designers and engineers and scientists begin to study the possible points where these things might not work and actually design for repairability, design things so that they can be fixed, so that they can be maintained, so that their lifespan extends and these kinds of things. So I'm sure everyone at uh, University of Science and Technology knows about what this is, yes? Does anyone not know what it is? Yeah? Yes, very good, Sam. <laughs> it's a Star Trek communicator. This is an actual prop from the film. So it was on, it was on auction because there are Star Trek fans who love to collect these kinds of things. And it, it's just a prop, so we know that. It's, it's inert, it doesn't really do anything. Uh, it's meant to be kind of fiddled with and it's never really shown in super close-up, so production designers and prop designers you know, kind of scratch their head and they make a decision about what it should be like. It needs to be in the hand, it needs to sort of suggest some kind of communication capability, it needs to have some dials because communication things have that, and they just make the prop, and the prop's used uh, in, the, in, the, in the telling of the story. And through the telling of the story, we understand what it is. They give it a name, there's certain behaviors and interactions that occur around it, um, and it, it has those, if, you, if anyone remembers Star Trek, it always has those points of like slight failure where the communication doesn't quite work right, and that to us is like, totally get it. It's like radio. Radios don't always work well. Perfect. Then there's this thing called the Star Trek Starfleet Technical Manual. Like, what's this? So this was a, a, a book that's put together. You can still, you can still get it. It's, um, you find it on eBay and that kind of thing. It's a, it's a technical manual that was done completely outside the context of the Star Trek production itself. So it's done completely independent of that. So no one from, from CBS or Paramount or the companies that produced it said, we need a, Star Trek, uh, a Starfleet technical manual. It never appears in any of the stories, nothing. It was created by this guy called Franz Joseph. Franz Joseph was a mechanical, uh, mechanical illustrator in the aerospace industry around Los Angeles. So he spent his days doing diagrams, technical diagrams, illustrations, schematics of things uh, having to do with aviation. And he has a remarkable ability to kind of draw in that way that communicates technical perfection and communicates a level of uh, mechanical ingenuity that if you saw it, you'd just be like, that looks like a real thing. That looks like it should be if it were a, an actual real bit of aviation kit. And so he created these things. So again, completely outside of the Star Trek universe, he was creating technical diagrams of the communicator, which is just a prop. It's a film prop. 
but he took it upon himself because of his level of interest and engagement and because of his technical skill. And he just thought it would be cool to actually design what the technical manual must look like for this fictional film. But it's a real technical manual. Like you buy it and you hold it and you flip through it. And it's absolutely wonderful kind of imagination uh, that's represented through these diagrams. And I remember as a young child uh, really wanting this because I was like, well, kind of naively like, well, this will tell me how to build this stuff, certainly. I mean, look at it. It's just... That looks right. It's got a vent. It's got a red LED and a yellow LED. Of course it does. I mean, it's got an antenna. That's an antenna. Got it. Cool. And look, it's even got a scale to show you how big it should be. And then he goes a step further. Like, what? A technical schematic? Now I really can build it. That looks right. Look, it's got a speaker. Yeah, of course. It's got three transistors, a few switches, some resistors. An inductor for the antenna? Yeah, I've heard about that. That's cool. And it's got a parts list. Are you kidding me? The level of like kind of the, the, the level of imagination that goes so deep to create something that its veracity, its possibility becomes attains to this level is is genius. And and if I look back, I think this was the reason, I'm almost sure, sure this is the reason that I wanted to become an engineer. Because it seemed like, okay. If you want to make something like a Star Trek communicator, which certainly we're going to need at some point because there'll be space travel, I need to learn how to build these things. I need to learn how to read this. And on the other hand, now in my sort of role as a designer, as an engineer, as a technologist, using the same approach to help people understand what could be, to show things as if they, could, as if they existed, is a, I've learned to be a very powerful tool for doing design. Here's another remarkable thing. So it was a bestseller in the New York Times list, which is amazing. And if you, if you believe some of the lore amongst Trekkies, it was one of the reasons that, uh, that CBS decided to bring Star Trek back. They, they originally um, uh, shut the show down because they didn't think anyone was really interested and the ratings weren't that good, but they had no visibility. It wasn't like the internet today where you can tell how many people are following you on social networks. They really had no visibility about that entire universe of Star Trek fans who are actually going, you know, trading these kinds of books and making them on their own. Absolutely fascinating. Everyone knows what this is, right? The baddest spaceship in the universe, the Millennium Falcon. So in the Star Wars universe, this was, did the Kessel Run in 3.2 parsecs, which is quick. But it's fictional, right? So it's just something that you see in the films, uh, Han Solo and Chewbacca. But look, there's a repair manual for it. How could that be? Who would repair it? And the interesting thing here is that this, is, this Haynes company is actually, they actually make repair manuals. So real repair manuals, this is the one I had for my VW Rabbit, the first car that I had. Because uh, after I bought the car, I didn't have any money to actually pay someone to repair it. I had to fix it myself. So you have one of these, and it tells you how to fix the car. And then you have something like this, which tells you how to fix an Enterprise, if you happen to have one in your garage. And these are actual books, so you can go and you can, you can actually buy them. And they do a bit of work of talking about the fiction of the film. They tell you a little bit of the history of the Enterprise. They tell you, they go into the different systems and describe how they might behave. They give you examples from the, from the, from the TV series itself and from uh, the films about what particular systems and how they evolved over time from the different versions of the Enterprise. And again, it's this way, in my mind, of, doing, of, of having a bit of fiction sort of shape, make it tangible, shape and inform and expand your imagination of what could be possible. But then you start thinking about the kinds of repair, you know, using repair manuals as a particular approach to telling stories about the design or the idea or the technology that you might be working on. And it just brings that level of kind of engagement where you're not starting with that at the top level saying like, how does this thing, you know, what is this technology and how does it exist and having to do all that complex work of describing it at a very high level, you're actually saying like, I'm going to describe how you fix that one little part and through that telling of the fixing of the one little part, I begin to understand what this thing might do and how it might behave, how people might actually use it. I can start talking about how they might be challenged by it. I have to create a list of all the kinds of confusing things that I might need to fix as a designer to make it more legible to people. I can take this repair manual, I can give it to a friend, I can say, could you fix this with it? And they'll go through and they'll ask you to describe other aspects of it or flesh some part of it out. 
This is my favorite one, known as Workshop Manual for the Apollo 11, which is, you know, again, it does that same thing. It's including the Saturn V, the CM107, the SM107, and the LM5. Cool. That should cover me. Okay. So now let's move on to quick start guides. And there's a whole list of these. So I think we've got like something like 64 different kinds of idioms. These are the ones that I think um, are sort of very typical that we end up using. So the quick start guide. So everyone knows what a quick start guide is. You get something, it seems like it should be completely simple to use, but you start, you look at it and you're not sure if that's the on button or the off button. So you look at the quick start guide, which is meant to guide you through that first set of steps, like the main bits of functionality. How do I just get this thing going? so that I can operate it and get on with my life. So uh, a number of years ago, when we were working on another a project, we, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the products in the, in the catalog was a self-driving car. And this is, you know, so people are very fascinated about self-driving cars. What do they do? How do they behave? Uh, do we want them around the world? Are they going to be safe? All these kinds of questions that people have about them. So we did this kind of fake advertisement for a car called Al Gore, and it was going to be like the, the Google, so it's for algorithm. It was going to be the Google car, and we just sort of described in a way. And then someone asked us, like, well, how, how does it operate? So that's a very good question. How would it operate? And so we decided to create this quick start guide. Now it's, a, it's an Amazon car, because we thought, like, that would be really kind of, why would Amazon make a car? And one of the reasons that we maybe put Amazon in there, which is a little bit unexpected, is that oftentimes life is unexpected and we don't know, you know even as companies, what they're going to get into and what they might do or why they might do it. So it started raising that question about what is Amazon and how does it become what it might be in the future? Make, not just making the assumption that it's going to be selling books and laundry detergent and food. It might get into something entirely different because companies have to continue expanding. What we did first is we created a number of design fiction uh, news articles. So mostly fictional things, <laughs> entirely fictional things that sort of suggested some of the topics that people might be writing about in this future. So what are the kinds of behaviors and human, uh, human rituals that it might evolve? What are the kinds of news that might, people might be describing? What are, the, uh, what are the topics that begin to become addressed in this world with self-driving cars? So one was like the rise of the well-rested com commuter. So this just might be a phenomenon that all of a sudden people are using self-driving cars, commuters are no longer tired when they get to work because they maybe have a nap, maybe they have their breakfast on their way to work while the car is driving, read the newspaper, uh, talk to friends, these kinds of things that become a, 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 almost a cultural phenomenon so that people get to work well-rested and then they're energized for work. Another one might be, maybe on the other side of things, that San Francisco, as you may know, is, is very, very expensive to live in. So people, rather than renting cars and new graduates who don't have a lot of money, actually just decided, you know, I'll get in my car and I'll put it in infinite loop mode and just have it drive around the city forever and ever and just go in the back seat and sleep. So I don't need to have an apartment. You know, another example, maybe people are able to hack the car to do ram raids uh, on jewelers and rob places. This will be a phenomenon that you, know, you could imagine happening. If it's a self-driving car, you basically just take it down the street, do a little programming, wait for it to just ram into the car. That way you don't, you don't hurt yourself, and then you just run in and make off with the jewels. Another one sort of like scandalous thing, like Justin Bieber takes a nap after having too much to drink one night, and his car loses GPS signal and just drives around in circles and Paparazzi take pictures of him sleeping in the back of his car. Again, these are the kinds of things. So it's fun to do. It gives you a sense of now I'm creating a sort of larger world around this technology. I'm not just talking about self-driving cars. I'm talking about the cars as a cultural phenomenon and the kinds of behaviors that might evolve out of that. And these are important stimuli because of the kinds of things. So you see, uh, for example, another one. So now we're saying that Amazon is now the third biggest auto manufacturer. Like People might say, like, that doesn't make any sense at all. But I mean, who would have guessed that Amazon would be the world's largest uh, seller of goods? These things can happen in a moment. And so looking at them and sort of challenging our assumptions in a way allows us to understand a little bit more about that world. So this is what we did. We wanted to do a workshop to actually create that quick start guide for the self-driving car. We started like this, just a blank slate. We knew that it's, we needed to fill it in with some contents. It would have a cover, a front cover and a back cover. 
and then we sort of set to work. So we used some of that stimulus initially. So these were uh, workshop participants at a conference. They, uh, they were provided some of the stimulus material ahead of time. We sort of talked it through. You can see it in the background. There's a bunch of, uh, so we had a bit of a discussion around it. Uh, and then we set up, we divided people into groups. There's me sitting in the corner. I had the fun job of creating the, uh, the frequently asked questions in the back. Uh, people began working on specific topics around the Quick Start Guide. And so we, we divided ourselves up into groups of four or five people. And each group, they, they had a particular topic. Um, we, we gave them some sort of parameters, some guardrails around how they would do that topic. In other words, how many words they could use, because Quick Start Guides shouldn't be something that you have to kind of pour through like a book. It needed to be in a particular uh, style that allowed, people, allowed an idea to communicate quickly. And then it needed to have some illustrations, because oftentimes these things are just pointing at, indicating how things might behave. And all that work, all that doing, you know, working at that level of detail is as if you were given a task as a designer or engineer at a company that said, like, you gotta do the quick start guide. We're launching in like two weeks. And you have to actually represent all these things, all this work that you've done now very, very quickly in, in a form that can be legible to like lots and lots of different people and different cultures and different experiences and so forth. And these are sort of how we divided up the sections. So there was like, of course, there's got to be legal claims because companies want to protect themselves from misuse and that kind of thing. There would be an artificial intelligence system. There would be ways to get in and get out of the car. And you'll see why that's important in a moment. How do you program a route? So in other words, how do you tell the car where you want to go? These are all things that are so important for self-driving cars that we might now just take for granted. But you really have to understand them and be able to develop them. Someone might say, like, well, how do you program a route? And you're like, well, OK. I don't know, the car drives itself. I'm not sure how you'd do that, but let me try to figure that out. And then there would be the, the manual override, because there might be times when you don't want the car to drive itself or it gets confused. And then uh, the, uh, the AV system. So we imagined, and it's part of the, part of the stimulus, that, well, so if you're self-driving cars, like, it might get boring after a while. Like, what do you do then? There's got to be like some kind of entertainment, some music, or maybe the car can serve food, and how does that work exactly? Is there a microwave in it? And these kinds of things have to be sort of worked out. And all that is kind of, you know, you're working at that low level, that can then sort of bubble up and gives you more ideas about actually what a self-driving car would be. And so these are some of the things that the groups were doing. So four groups, each has this particular tasks. Um, you know, one of the, 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 the sanitizing car. So in, we also imagine that the car in the future that was self-driving, you might be able to loan it out to people to make a little bit of money or like a car sharing, sharing service, but then the car might come back like kind of smelling not so nice from someone else or maybe someone ate some food in there that you don't want the smell in there anymore. So how do you actually sanitize it? And this might be more routine than if you owned a car today and maybe like once a month you kind of clean it out. It might be every day, every time you get the car back from someone. And so then we sort of put it together in this kind of schematic way to represent what all these sections would be and what they might look like and how they might lay out and so forth. And then one of our approaches, uh, particularly for us at the Near Future Laboratory, is that we like to do things as quickly as we can. So literally, after the, after the, after the workshop team had done that, uh, myself and Nick Foster and Nick Lenova, we sat down, and Fabian was there as well, we sat down and we said, okay, let's very, very quickly make this. Let's like, actually create the thing so that we can then share it back to the rest of the conference. And so we quickly created this representation of it that we could print out. You know, we did, made decisions on color, we made de decisions on the particular style in which the things should be represented, uh, the call-outs, like all those kinds of things were, were something that were very important for us to, to get right. So it looked real, because we wanted to give something to someone and have them say like, oh wait, is this real? And in that moment where they're kind of like believing and not, not believing, sort of believing but not believing, but you guys are always doing jokes, so I don't know if this is true or not, we can then have a conversation that becomes productive in a way that isn't if you're telling something like, oh, this is entirely, this is just fiction. Or you're telling something, this is real, and they're like, no, it's not, I don't believe it at all. So maybe just looking quickly at a couple things. So um, I love this idea that you might not actually park your vehicle. Uh, it might be always kind of operating. It might always be running. And so you'd have this special mode that you put it in, and if you leave it in that V section for 30 seconds, then it goes into uh, Uber mode, and you've, you've got 30 seconds to get out of the car, and then it sort of goes, goes off and tries to find people to pick up. And it might do that for, for a while, until you're done with dinner, or until the next morning, or that kind of thing. 
And then, so how do you get your car back? Let's say you finish dinner early. So you have to go through and describe the procedure for actually retrieving your car. And you would you know, cr press the fob, and it would let you know that your vehicle's been requested and start telling you when it's getting closer. Uh, you might have to have ways in which you say, look, I'm going to load my car out, but I'm only going to be like half an hour, and I don't want it to go further than these distances. So how do you do that? You know, those are things that people are going to want to do. You don't want to, you know, I remember getting into a, uh, a car sharing service and asked the guy, like, what's the longest trip you did? And from Los Angeles, he said, well, someone asked me to drive him to Las Vegas, which is about six hours away. And I was like, whoa, that's crazy. So thinking about ways in which you would actually design a system that gets, gives those kinds of constraints is important. The errand mode, I love this one. So, you know, you're at home, and it's like there's no food, and you're like, I want pizza, but I don't feel like getting in the car. I know what I'll do. I'll send the car to go get pizza, which is fantastic. You can imagine, like, having that ability to, like, pick up the laundry, I don't know, pick up the kids because I'm too lazy, uh, go, go uh, drop something off at a friend's house. But then as soon as you do that, like, that's cool. So, like, okay, so this is going to go and get my pizza from Pizza Hut. But then we had this whole set of questions, like, okay, so how does the guy at Pizza Hut get it in the car? Like, are you just going to let the guy just put it on the seat? Like, no, because then they'll, you'll get cheese on your seat or who knows what's happened. So now the cars have a special trunk, as we described, where food can get inserted. So you, the guy just opens it up with a special unlock code and he puts the food in and it keeps it nice and warm. But then we were like, in the frequently asked questions, like, oh, one of those guys is going to put not only your pizza in there, but your milkshake. So it should be hot or cold. What should it do? And so then you have to figure out ways in which, oh, now we need a system where it can detect what's in there and maybe create microclimate so it keeps the milkshake milky and cold and the pizza nice, hot, and warm, and gooey. And so all these kinds of things begin to evolve and develop. It's simple enough to say, like, oh, yeah, it'd be great. It could go get pizza for you. But then you have to understand, like, what the challenges are going to be around that and begin to design those systems in. And then you'll be the clever one when someone says, well, how does it keep the pizza hot and the milkshake cold? So, like, ah, I figured it out because I made a quick start guide to tell people how to do that. Then the refresh system, so all these warnings around it, which are, which are fun. So, you know, this, this, this special trademarked refresh mode that allows you to uh, clean the car out, maybe because it's got that pizza smell in it, or maybe because someone was in there and they didn't take a shower in the morning, or they brought their dog in the car because they're dropping the dog off and that kind of thing. So you have to, you have to you set the mode, but then you have to get out of the car because it just flushes it out with these chemicals to like, kind of make it smell nice. And it just does it very, very quickly. And so all these kind of continues around that, and you have to be careful about uh, getting it on you and these kinds of things. But these are things that, you know, again, I'm just sort of say, oh, stating the point over and over because I think it's important, like making it seem like it's not the most perfect thing in the world because we know that the world is not the most perfect place and that technology in particular oftentimes has these points where it's like you trip over something unexpected. There's a certain set of behaviors or a certain aspect of the system, like, oh, my computer won't start up. Now what? And reflecting those things and reflecting those everyday moments makes things seem a little bit more real. Some of the frequently asked questions. Uh, so my favorite one is, you, um, uh, I've, I've left someone or something in the car when I put it into self-drive mode. So people do this. A friend of mine told me that once he... Him and, his, him and his wife were in a very intense conversation, and they left their kid on the top of the car, in the, in the car seat, and started walking into the store, and they were like, wait a minute, where's our kid? And they had to go back and get it. Like, that's going to happen. People are going to leave their wallets, their phones in the car when it goes someplace else. So what do you do? And so, like any good kind of like complicated problem, we just tell people to look, into the man look in the manual. Someplace between pages 19 and 41 tells you how to get your grandmother back, who's now still in the back seat. Okay, so let's move on to product catalogs. This is maybe my favorite design fiction idiom because uh, I think it's a wonderful way in which you can uh, very quickly describe you know, almost whimsical, fantastical uh, products that might exist in the world. And I typically like to start at the kind of the, 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 the far end. So once technology has become so normal, ordinary, and everyday that you find it in the corner store for like 99 cents, very, very cheap. So if you think all the technology, if you went to any corner store now, you would find remarkable advanced technology. Some of it has won Nobel Prizes. So think of like laser pointers, which now you buy to play with your cats and to point at things. That's a laser. 
Is no one else amazed by that? You think about aspirin. There was a time when to have a medical aid like that was a miracle. Flashlights? I mean, imagine if you were in, in the olden times and just the light went out and that was it. You're kind of like, oh, I wish I had a flashlight. Maps? I mean, those used to be the things that only kings and sea captains had. And now you, they're, they're in our pocket. You can get them in paper maps. It, it's absolutely amazing. And so for me, looking at the, you know, what we call the 99 cent store, the discount store, the dollar store, these are places where you see uh, what you might call the long tail of technology innovation when it becomes literally even lower than commodity. It's practically free. You can get five of them for a dollar. They come in party colors. Uh, you buy a couple because you have some friends who might want, you know, uh, a lighter. Like to be able to have fire in your hand like that is, is miraculous. Is no one else amazed? Just, we just take it for granted, which is fine. That's, of course, the reason why you do it, because if you show things as existing at that level, it almost seems like, oh, okay, yeah, there will be a world in which, you know, like an iPhone or something similar to it, uh, you could say like, oh, I've, geez, I, I, I didn't bring a phone, I've traveled, but I know I can go to this guy here and I can get one for very cheap. I can even rent it. So the question that we ask is like, what does the 99 cent, 99 cent future look like? What is that, what might be there? And so when we first did this, so I gathered a group of, uh, of, of amazing friends and sort of colleagues, engineers, technologists, artists, science fiction writers, museum curators, graphic designers, illustrators, filmmakers, and I set a brief. And the brief was basically like, take today, and so this was in 2014, and project it into the future. So take all the things that we think are miraculous today and make them 99 cents and available at every corner store. What does that world begin to look like? And so at the time, what was really fascinating, and still things are fascinating today, were like um, uh, 3D printing, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, algorithmic everything, so everything derived by algorithm, um, privacy, all these topics we wanted to then extend in the future. And also, very, one aspect that I thought was very was fascinating where you see a lot of reports about sites of manufacturing moving. So not just uh, in large manufacturing centers, not even just in China, but begin, beginning to move in other places. And when you look at that, oh, and then cryptocurrency was really interesting. And just take all those elements, and so we spent a little bit of time uh, discussing and sort of workshopping, similar to the way we did the Quick Start Guide, and imagining what would be the things that would exist in the future. We also created a, a bit of a work kit so, so that participants could do a little bit of work prior to coming to the workshop. So we created this set of cards, and the cards were almost like they were, uh, they were divided up into uh, three different groups, and each one of the cards you could almost play a game to kind of come up with an idea of what the product might be. So you might take um, refrigerator and artificial intelligence. And then you have to say, like, okay, what would that be? If I had a refrigerator that had artificial intelligence. And then you get these crazy kind of combinations and then just sort of make lists of possible products that might exist. And then we do what you do in workshops, which is you stand around, you make things, you get lots of post-it notes, you discuss and debate, present different things. So there's some things like uh, something called mongoose tape. Someone just had a name, we didn't know what it was, but then we have to fill in what mongoose tape might be using our sort of principles. Uh, umbrellas that had certain sort of uh, intelligent behaviors, why would they do that? Then we begin to discuss what that would be and why people would need umbrellas of that sort. Uh, we had a, a remarkable experience. So um, a, a friend of mine, Mark Ruther, is a curator of the Henry Ford Museum. So we actually, more stimulus was our uh, walking around the Henry Ford Museum of, of Industry. So we could see like all the, basically they've cataloged almost everything that humankind has made in the industrial era. So everything from uh, different toys and, and uh, objects and this kind of thing. And then we did the same thing. We sort of created a schematic of what that catalog might look like. And here's some of the examples. So um, drones were a big thing. So a drone that could walk your dog seemed like a good idea. A drone that could follow your child. Look, he's being a bad boy. We have to give everything a price. Sometimes things... Uh, have have a price, but then they're also they're being 
funded, so they're almost like Kickstarter projects. And that, again, made it seem like, oh, that could actually be a way in which products happen. People decide. And we know that happens now. People decide whether they actually want it by whether or not it gets funded. A phone, not a smartphone, is just clever. Not sure exactly what that is, but it's sort of just not quite super smart. It's just sort of smart. A panda jerky, you're like, whoa, panda jerky, that's not cool at all. But we imagine a world in which actually now they figured out how to uh, had to, had to, had to prandis, had to propagate through maybe some genetic science, and now actually some of them escaped, and now they're like crazy. They're all over the place. So our behavior, our understanding of what a panda is, completely changes from cute and cuddly to like, get out of my garbage, go away. So people start making panda jerky. Data enlargement, like big data, was a thing. So we imagine that there would actually be a service where people were like, we can make your data bigger. It's not big enough. Better service. No data type is too small. Even 128 bits can be beefed up. Films that are entirely made by algorithm. So there's no, no directors, no actors. It's just all basically deciding what people want to see. You might even decide at home. Like, I want to see action, adventure. There should be a bank robbery. And uh, just a little bit of romance, but not too much. And then I want the good guy to win in the end. And a few moments later, you have your film. I think that's kind of cool. A special toilet that senses your body's behaviors and sends a message out to Twitter so all your friends know. And so this was a whole catalog. So a huge thing, like uh, um, a couple hundred sort of ideas for the future. And we, of course, you have to make it. So we actually made them, so we printed them out. We've sold thousands. People seem to love it, which is great. Um, this is the website. There's the guy. It's an old-fashioned me. And we just wanted to make it seem like it was something that, yeah, it's real. It is real. So you can, you can get it online. And then we did the same thing. I'll just show you briefly for IKEA. So what would the IKEA future look like? And again, IKEA is that thing that's sort of familiar to very many people. And so imagining what might be the things that exist in their future, um, sort of still making it seem like IKEA. Sometimes there's a drone. There's still like blankets and stuff, but they have certain behaviors and characteristics to them. Um, kitchen cooktop surfaces that can cook for you. So you make it seem like it exists today, but just with a little added twist to it. That's my talk. Thank you. Thank you for this amazing presentation of your work and your ideas. You're welcome. So we'll open the question from the floor. But like, what can I do with it? Oh, yeah, it worked like that. Uh, thank you for your talk. Very interesting. You're welcome. How do you relate with cools? I mean, this is not, not only if funny, it's useful. And so how do you uh, relate with cools? Do you know how design schools, for instance, or engineering schools are integrating this, this methodology? Because it's a, it's a methodology. Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we do oftentimes, um, so where I'm from in California, often with Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, uh, CalArts. Um, the, you know, I, I was a professor, so uh, when I taught at University of Southern California, that was also part of the, uh, you know, the, the part of the, one of the roles that I kind of brought in one of the approaches. Uh, and oftentimes when we do workshops, they're oftentimes at like professional uh, conferences. And so more often than not, there'll be also graduate students and so forth there. So it's something that uh, we're, we're heavily invested in as an approach. And I think you know, all of us are in the Near Future Laboratory, so we're, we're in some one way or another involved in education. And so this is for the design schools, but what about the engineering schools? Um, I would say, it, in, in our experience, it's been less so in the engineering schools except for EPFL. Uh, where Nikola Nova w had spent some time, so he, he sort of integrated that, uh, that there. Because this is the target, actually. Yes. 
yes. more than designers because designers are not reluctant to use uh, this kind of approach, but the engineers, they are not thinking this way, so uh, this yes, is I the agree. challenge. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it, it is a challenge, but I think, I think increasingly the, uh, it, it might be, you know, with, with exceptions as there always would be uh, a, an approach. So, so MIT actually has a, uh, a faculty position specifically in design fiction. So it's, you know, that's one area, certainly. Yeah, I think you have to throw it, so good throw. Nice. All right. Okay, so I attended a meeting recently. It's called the Future of Medicine. I wonder if you have any uh, catalog for biomedical uh, front, bio, uh, biotechnology? Uh, not specifically, but that's a great brief. I'd, I'd love to do that. There, there's some aspects of the... Um, so you know, it's 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 a it's a template. So and and it's not exclusively something that is you know just for us at the near future laboratory. Like we would hope that other people would also apply that approach. And you know, the the we're actually working on a manual that describes how to how to go about this. But the you know the principle I think if you follow in this is 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 fairly simple. You like look at what exists today, what the current like kind of like leading edge ideas and research and technology is. And then you just try to find like, okay, what would that be like in the future? And oftentimes it's easier, I find it's easier not to give a date, just say some other time. What would that look like? How would it be something that would be applied in a very routine way? Something where you might say like, oh, you know, I, um, uh, I, think, I, I think I need heart surgery this morning. I'm just gonna go into, into my bathroom and use this particular procedure. So it just seems something that exists. But we haven't, so in the catalog, there are little bits that, that touch on biomedicine uh, and advances in biomedicine. There's some things for um, people who, who don't have good attention anymore because they spend too much time on the phone. So different devices to help, help uh, those kinds of conditions. And sometimes it's starting with the condition, like conditions now and what they, how they might be addressed in the future. But I think that's a very good idea. I think, I think you should do it. You're the guy. Wind up. Oh, good throw. I was wondering how your methodology um, ties into the design thinking methodology. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure how how it how it does. Um, so I've presented this work at, at IDEO, which is like one of the kind of centers for design yeah. thinking, and talked to them quite a bit about it. I, I, if I were to, to just say, um, my initial thinking is, and I'm not saying you know w w which one is better or different from the other, but I think my background as, a, as an engineer, as someone who loves to prototype things, like I almost move too quickly when I have an idea, like all of a sudden I'm trying to make it, like literally, yeah. either coding it or building it, or, and I, I haven't quite figured out exactly what it is, but that's okay, this is how I begin to think, is that design thinking does more thinking than making, mm -hmm. like actually creating a tangible thing, even if that tangible thing is you know like a 140 page product catalog. You know, if it's something we actually have to get into the material and go to the level of detail where you need to make font choice, color choice, you know, style of writing, find images, um, I feel like design thinking sort of um, maybe operates more in, in we're gonna create a presentation about our thinking as opposed to creating objects based on our thinking. And That's do you do actually build prototypes? So you go into the maker? Um, absolutely. Kind of yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's a, a bit basically where I came from when I started doing this. Was I would make I would make little objects and I would 3D print things and I would actually build the circuit for something that made no good sense at all. <laughs> like I would I would spend weeks and weeks and weeks like designing the you know electrical schematic, getting the printed circuit board made, building the circuit board by hand, um, and people would look at it and be like, oh, that's cool. Like you know what is it? And I would almost ask them, what do you think it is? <laughs> Okay, um, great oh, talk. Whoa. Uh. <laughs> great talk. Um, so, we're at a university. You've worked at universities. Um, in the future, uh, what will universities look like? Like, what will the, what will the catalog look like? What, have you done any work with that? Do you have any yeah, ideas? Yeah, actually, we had, we had a catalog in the, in the catalog for a university. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember what the, it was all, um, there, was, there was no fixed coursework. It was, all, it was all sort of generated 
for students uh, based on their interests and this is a curriculum so you might inter intersect and overlap with people in different ways uh, but it was it was back to this idea of like algorithms the algorithm sort of knows better how to you know define what you should do Lousy, Hello. lousy throw. I would like to know how the IP works with this. If, for example, a startup make, actually makes one of these products or something similar to it, do, do you have some rights on it or how it works? Yeah, we've sued lots of people. Actually, that's how we sustain ourselves. It's actually, that's our business. We're patent trolls. No, um, we've actually had people come to us and say like, hey, but that's already been done. And we say like, well, okay, you know, that's fine. It's, it's nothing, no big, no big deal. But people almost say, you know, they look at it as like something that's predicting the future rather than us just having a good time trying to imagine the future. And so that's, that's never happened. Um, and it's just, you know, not quite interested in that. But good question, yeah. Last question. I love it. Uh, you have brought serendipity to a new level because serendipity is already incredible. You're looking for something and find something else that, that could be very useful. But with fictional design, it's not even you're looking for something that you actually do one day, but then you'll also find perhaps some fantastic things. Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So please make sure that you post your feedback and comment on our social media, so uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <gasps> yes. Thank you. Look, I got a toy. Yeah, you don't, you don't open the box. Thank you. Actually.